is a blessed Savior, call him be your friend. Oh, you heavy lady, come to me and rest. No, 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 I'm a child. I, your Lord, will be. Bring me everybody. Bring me every care. Come on to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. Hear me and be blessed. I'm a meek and lowly. Come and close my mind. Come, my yoke is easy. Come, my boat is light. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He gave up everything so that we can be saved. In turn, he's telling us to give up something for him so that others through our messages, through our ministry, through our sacrificial love may be saved as well. We're asking, O oh Lord, that all you require from us by your grace, by your enablement, in your love, will do it in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you'll use us for your glory, that in these last days, the people that have not known you, they will know you through us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that all you demand from us, your grace to do, your grace to be obedient, your grace to sacrifice, your grace to move out and do the work you have given us to do, you'll grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank the Lord for bringing us to this point in our workers' retreat. We bless the name of the Lord because he, he himself is blessing us and enriching our lives. We started this uh, workers' retreat last night. And already we've been having some wonderful time with the Lord and with one another. Today we come to look at an important subject. It's the call of a Christian leader. There have been people in this world who have recognized the importance of the call of God. They have understood the high calling of the Lord, or the heavenly calling of the Lord, or the holy calling that we receive from the Lord. It was um, C.H. Spurgeon that was talking to his son child. He had a son. He said, my son, I have a message for you. He said, put this in your heart. If God has called you to be a missionary, do not stoop down, do not bend down, do not lower yourself to be a millionaire. Write that down. I'm saying the same thing to you. That Spurgeon told his own son, if the Lord has called you to be a minister, do not stoop down, do not bend low to become a millionaire, which shows the high value and the great value that Spurgeon placed on the call to Christian leadership. That is so high and it's so great that if you have any other call in the whole world, in the whole universe, you will not stoop low to receive or to take that kind of call. The call the Lord has given us, number one, He gives us call to salvation that comes to everybody and the call is going out. And the call is going to the people out there, come unto me, I will give you rest. That is the call to salvation. When the Lord puts out the call, and He says, all you who are weary, all you are sinful, all of you that are tossed here and there, come and find rest in me, is the call to salvation. Now you come to the Lord, you are born again, you are a child of God. And then another call comes to you, and it's a call to sanctification. It calls you to a holy life. It calls you to a pure life. It calls you to a sanctified life. And then, as you are saved, and as you are sanctified, the call has not ended there. It now calls you 
to service. Please understand that a great thing is coming your way. That this is a great privilege even angels would like to have. But God has not given the privilege to angels. He has given the privilege to you and to me. Normally and naturally, we are unworthy to have the call to service. To the service of proclaiming the gospel. To the service of telling the lost world that the Savior has died. But he brushed aside the unworthiness. And he makes you worthy in the beloved. Worthy in Christ. Worthy by grace. Worthy by the love of God. Worthy by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. And now that he makes you worthy, he says, I'm calling you. And as I call you, you need to understand that number one, it's a heavenly calling. It's coming from heaven. Because we're told in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. It's telling us that this is not an earthly call. And it is not a human call. This is a call coming from the Lord himself. And you become partakers of the heavenly calling. Can I just tell you brothers and sisters, the next time temptation comes your way, that the road is too rough. And the mountain is too steep and it's too high. And the difficulties are too great. I think I want to give it up. After all, if I leave the work of pastoring or preaching or singing or leading or ushering or working for the Lord, I'm sure you'll find a lot of other people to put there. Never allow yourself to think like that. Because you have a heavenly calling. And you want to hold it with both hands. And I pray that this privilege that the Lord has given you, nobody will take it away from you in Jesus' name. Heavenly calling. Number two, it's a holy calling. A holy calling. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. You remember then that uh, number one is a heavenly calling. Number two, it's a holy calling. It's a special calling. And it's calling that is coming from on high. Coming from the Lord Himself. And, and you need to walk according to the calling you have been given. A special calling indeed. Number three, a high calling. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. High calling. How high is this? As high as a great privilege of taking people from earth to heaven. When you imagine it, the calling the Lord has given me. Think about any other calling in the world. The calling to be a professional. The calling to be a professor. The calling to be a medical doctor. This one is higher. That's why it says it's a high calling. And I challenge you. Any other calling you are thinking about, and you say, I want to spend my life in something, and you pick anybody, anybody in the world, and say, this is what they have done, this is what they have done, this is what they have done. What a great privilege they had. We read about the ministry. This one is higher. Whatever you can think about, whatever may be presented to you, whatever you may think that, you know, if I can do this, if I can do this, if I can do that, this is a high calling, and it is higher than any other calling you may have in this world. Because this is a calling that the effect of it, the influence of it, and the fruit of it will continue until you leave this earth and you get to heaven. And even when you get to heaven, the fruit of your labor will still continue for all eternity. And if anybody has been deceiving you, if anybody has been confusing you, that you'll give up such a high calling like this, you cannot find any other thing, any higher thing. I'm going to go a step further. For example, you understand, to start with, the main religions, and whatever calling anybody has in any other religion, this one, the calling into the Christian faith is much higher. Think about it now. There are many, many churches, and this one is called, and this one is called, and this one is called. And you say, that fellow is a minister in that other church. That fellow is a leader in that other assembly. And that fellow is a pastor in that other place. 
And you happen to be a pastor. You happen to be an overseer. You happen to be a leader. And you, my brothers and sisters, you happen to be leaders and workers in Deeper Life Bible Church. What kind of church do you think you belong to? What kind of understanding do you have about the church you belong to? This calling in this church to teach the fullness of the truth of the gospel and to honestly contend for the faith was delivered unto the saints. You can tell me without me telling you that the call you have here is higher than the call anybody has in any other church, in any other place. That's the reason I'm encouraging you. If God has put you here, and if God has put a seat for you there, and if God has put a strength for you there, I pray that the devil, or the messengers of the devil, will not make you to look at the calling you have as something low, as something cheap, that you will say, after all, I can also receive this calling, manifest this calling, and effect this calling in another place. Maybe you can, but this is higher than any other thing you can do. And God will help you. And even though you have a high calling now, God will take you higher. Even though you have a great thing on your hand now, God will make you greater. And whatever you have done for the Lord, we praise the Lord for you. Whatever you have done for the Lord, a greater thing is coming your way. A higher ministry is coming your way. Don't get discouraged. It's the Lord that has chosen you. In John chapter 15, I'm reading to you from verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And sometimes you have a low esteem of yourself. I'm not intelligent, but the Lord has chosen you. I'm not good enough, but the Lord has chosen you. I'm not capable enough, but the Lord has chosen you. I'm not as fruitful as so and so, but the Lord has chosen you. Do not depreciate yourself. Do not belittle yourself. Do not look down on yourself. And do not look down on the area of ministry that you are doing. It's not by accident. You are there for a purpose, and that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. You can never tell. You will never be able to tell until you get to heaven. How your ministry, how your area of work, how your encouragement, how your instruction, how your preaching, how your singing, how your ministration has ministered unto many, many people. It's when we get over there, you find some people beginning to say, praise the Lord, I'm here because of you. Praise the Lord, I'm in heaven because of your ministration unto me. I pray you will not lose your reward. Ye have not chosen me. But I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Whatsoever you ask the Father concerning your personal life and concerning the fruitfulness in your ministry, the Lord will give unto you in Jesus' name. I've just been telling you that you have a heavenly calling, you have a holy calling. You have a high calling. And let me ask you a question. What if right now in your secular work, what if in the things you are doing, you are transferred, and you are told that you are not going to do a kind of work. Yes, it's this kind of work you are still doing. But you are going to be transferred to the capital of our country. And you are going to work hand in hand, side by side, but with the president of the country. Obviously, if something like that happened to you, you'll say, I have promotion, and I have a high responsibility. See me, as lowly as I am, as unqualified as I am, I am not walking side by side with the president of the country. I have a surprising thing for you in First Corinthians chapter 3. Reading from verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. You cannot be higher than that. Walking with the president of your country, that will be great. There's something greater. And walking with the high educated people, scientists in the land, that's great. That's why there's something higher. There's something greater. That you become a laborer together with God. We are God's husbandry. We are God's building. According to the grace which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and I will build it thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 
from verse 1. We then are workers together with him. We then as workers together with him. Note that in your mind and recognize to start with you are not alone. Not only that, you are walking side by side with the Almighty God Himself. Now, the call of a Christian leader. We are called into the ministry. And when we are called into the ministry, the Lord gives us all the grace we need. All the strength we need. All the power we need. All the gifts we need to be able to do the work effectively. I'm going to divide the message to three parts. Number one. The call of sanctified servants. Number two, the commission to sanctifying service. A kind of service that purges other people. Think about what you're doing. You may not be able to tell the details. You might see this ordinary thing. I hope you stop using that kind of language. There's no work in the house of God that is ordinary. It's a sanctifying service. Whatever it is you are doing, everything, everything will come together to purify, to sanctify, to prepare, to perfect the people of God and prepare them for the coming of the Lord. It's not only the man standing at the pulpit, the one in the house fellowship, and the one in the zone, the brother there, and the sister there, and the men there, and the people that are not in the hall now, and the people that are in other places, and they are serving the Lord. It's everything combined. It's the totality of a combined effort that is getting the work done. Number three is a commitment to sacrificial service. I come to number one. In number one, you have the call of sanctified servants. As we look at the call of God upon our lives, we see that the Lord calls us, and He makes us His sons to start with. We're saved, that's how we become sons. And then He wants us now to serve, and then He sanctifies us. You remember the scripture that tells us about how we get prepared for the service of the Lord. You remember that after we have been saved, we are born again. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Sanctified, meet, suitable, fit, prepared for every good work. So then you understand that he calls us. And when he calls us, he calls us as sanctified servants. Now, you understand this. Uh, many times the Lord, when he calls, you may begin to look at yourself and you say, how could God call a person like me? When you think about the people in the Bible, they wouldn't have known, we wouldn't have known, except as the Lord began to reveal. Because known unto God are all his works from the foundation of the world. The Lord knew that you will, your heart will be sought. The Lord knew that you will yield to the gospel. Even before you were born again. Even before you were saved. He knew the future. Because he tells us in Acts chapter 15 verse 18. Known unto God are all his works from the foundation of the world. As you look back at your life, you begin to think about it now. I could have gone to that place. The Lord prevented me. I could have gone to do that thing. The Lord hindered me until He ordered my steps. Until I find myself where I am now. Until I find myself serving the Lord now. Until I find myself just preaching the gospel now. Until I find myself working for the Lord now. And as I look back, I saw that it looks like that calling of God has been upon your life before you were even saved. Because He knew you were going to respond. He knew your heart was going to be sought. He knew your heart was going to be tender. He knew you were going to yield to the watch of the Lord. Isn't that what the Lord told Jeremiah? Before you were born, I knew you. I knew you would respond. I knew you would accept. I knew that you will follow me. Isn't that what Paul the Apostle also was saying in Galatians chapter 1? Reading from verse 15 and verse 16. 
Look at the experience of Paul the Apostle. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I comfort not with flesh and blood. He said, I knew immediately that this will make my life profitable and useful. This will make my life what it ought to be. I grabbed that privilege. I held on to that privilege. And I would not let it go. He said immediately when the Lord called me, he saw the value of the call. He saw the greatness of the call. And he saw the importance of that call. And he said, I will not let this one go. And that's what the Lord is telling you too. That as you sense the call of God in your life, that you will say, this is for me. This is my chance. I will not let this go. The Lord will help you. And then you find out in um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, reading from verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise, and stand upon thy feet. It is something surprising here that the callings of God are without repentance. He did what he did by ignorance. And uh, that did not make the Lord to say, all right, I'm going to choose another person. That did not make the Lord to say, I, I, I thought it ought to be tender. I thought I knew him. And I thought I had a poor knowledge about what he will do and the choice he will make. But see, the person I'm planning to choose and the person I'm planning to put in place, see him, the way he's persecuting the church. But the Lord knew. He was doing it in ignorance. And so the call of God still came to him. And the Lord said, Rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. To make thee a minister and a witness of bo both of those things which thou hast seen. And of those things and the which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. The Lord was sending him as the Lord is sending you now. To open their eyes. That's what he was to do. To turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And you will see then that the call of God came to him. As we think about the call of God, we need to understand that Almighty God calls. Jesus calls. The Holy Spirit calls. That becomes then a Trinitarian call. The call from the Holy Trinity. God calls. Who called Moses? 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 Remove your shoes from off your feet. Because where you are standing is holy ground. And I will send you unto Pharaoh. And you will deliver the children of Israel. Who sent him? God the Father. And then we are told in Luke chapter 6. The call of the Lord Jesus. God calls, Jesus calls as well. In Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles, Jesus Calls. As you look at your call today, you need to understand that God called you. Jesus Christ called you. Don't you remember as Jesus was talking about his disciples? Thine they were. You gave them to me. And I've given them your word. You call them. And you gave them to me. And I too, I called them. But the Holy Spirit also calls. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Reading from verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Do you see there then that the Holy Spirit also calls? And as we are called, it means, one, we are called by God. Two, confirmed by Christ. Three, commissioned by the Spirit. 
called by God, confirmed by Christ, commissioned by the Spirit. That's the kind of calling that we have received. And as we look at that call, the Lord is calling us because He wants us, He wants us to serve in this generation. Remember, this is a generation. And if the time passes by, you will not be able to serve another generation. You serve your own generation. Moses served his generation. Joshua served his generation. David served his generation. Uh, David cannot be serving today. He's gone. He's gone to his reward. And uh, Peter cannot be serving today. He's gone on to his reward. This is your own time. Make the best use of the time you've got, of the privilege you've got, of the opportunity you've got, of the responsibility that you have got. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, referring to Saul in the Old Testament, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Whenever the Lord lays his hands upon us, there is one purpose in the heart of God. There is one intention in the heart of God. There is one singular plan, an adulterated plan, a complete plan, a sanctified plan, a great plan in the heart of God. And it is that you will fulfill the will of God. What is the will of God that men be saved? What is the will of God that people be sanctified? What is the will of God that His creatures will become His children? And they will serve Him. And when the Lord picks you up, when the Lord chooses you, when the Lord appoints you, this is what you are appointed for. That you will lead people to get saved and to get sanctified and to be praiseworthy unto the Lord. That's why it says over here, I found David, the son of Jesse, that at that time he found him. But today now it's not David, it's you. The Lord has found you. I said the Lord has found you. And as he appointed David, and he said, David will fulfill all my will in his own generation. You will fulfill the will of God in Jesus' name. Look at verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. After he had served his generation by the will of God, he fell on sleep. There's something here. You know that David fought many battles. And you know that the Philistines were after him. And Saul was after him. And the people of Achish, they were after him. And many, many people, as you read the story of David, but you know, he could not die until he had served his generation. Until he had done everything the Lord appointed him to do. And the next time, if it happens, a sickness comes your way, affliction comes your way, if it happens that any problem comes your way, as I told you in a faith clinic in the morning, don't, don't begin to say, I am dying. I'm going to die. You cannot die now. You have to fulfill the will of God. You have to serve this generation. The work the Lord has given you to do, you have to accomplish it. You have to finish it. You cannot fall on sleep. That means the sleep of death. You cannot die until this generation, you serve this generation by the will of God in Jesus' name. Because that's the way it happened to David, and that's the way it happened to all the other men of God. Didn't you hear the testimony of Paul the Apostle? He said, I finish my course. I run the race. A crown of righteousness is now awaiting me. Now I am ready to depart. He wasn't ready to depart. He wasn't ready to die until he finished. You will not go until you finish. Now, as we look at First, first Timothy chapter one, in First Timothy chapter one, we're reading from verse twelve. First Timothy chapter one, verse twelve. It tells us from verse 12, it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he put me, he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You know, Paul the Apostle received a lot of challenges. A lot of challenges in his ministry. Why didn't he quit? Oh, because he realized the Lord 
put me in the ministry. Do you, know, do you remember the time that uh, Paul the Apostle had a kind of, um, uh, let me use the word, uh, dissatisfaction, unhappiness with Peter because of the way Peter reacted and behaved. And he even came and rebuked him openly. What did it, uh, Paul say? Uh, I'm giving it up. Because if Peter that I mean chosen before me can do this kind of thing, this kind of unscriptural thing, I don't think it's worth it. Or because Peter did not put him in the ministry. And all the other people. Why didn't uh, Peter, uh, Paul the Apostle get discouraged? Barnabas has slept. And then look at this now. Ba uh, Demons has also forsaken me. Why didn't he just get discouraged? Oh, because Barnabas did not put him in the ministry. And Demas did not put him in the ministry. We may be walking together. Paul and Demas. Or Paul and Silas. But you will not forget. Because Paul never forgot. That it was the Lord that put him in the ministry. My brothers and sisters. The next time. You are doing something. It may be between the coordinator and the group coordinator. And the coordinator just does not appreciate. And what is a group coordinator has done? May not be simple, may just be something convenient. Uh, remember, my dear coordinator, I don't say if it's like this. I'm giving it up. You cannot give it up. The group coordinator did not put you in the ministry. God put you in the ministry. Uh, you know, my dear local pastor there, our state overseer, our region overseer may do something you don't appreciate. It's taking a decision that. Why should you take a decision like that? I'm discouraged. I cannot go on. I cannot serve in this region anymore. You are not there by accident. And because the Lord put you in the ministry, you cannot quit. And you cannot say, I, I'm giving it up. I cannot do it anymore. This is no more convenient. And my ministry is no more appreciated. The Lord put you in the ministry. You will stay in that ministry. Until you receive your reward in Jesus' name. And then he continues in verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and a jurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and with love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. What he meant is, I was the greatest of all sinners before the Lord found me. And yet, he did not count the greatness of my sin. He still saved me. And because he has saved me, in spite of my sin, in spite of my rebellion, in spite of the persecution I gave to the church, I'm going to keep on serving him. Something significant he tells us in verse 16. How be it, for this cause, I received mercy, that in me was... Jesus Christ might show, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern, for a pattern, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul the Apostle said, the way the Lord dealt with me, he actually did that because he wanted to make me a pattern. What do we see in the life and the ministry of Paul the Apostle as we talk about him as a pattern? Let me just tell you in uh, some points. Number one, saved. Number two, set apart. Separated. Number three, sanctified. Number four, spirit filled. Number five, saint. Number six, strong. Number seven, singular. As you look at the Apostle Paul, and he said, the Lord has made me a pattern. And he made me a pattern of the people that will be called into the ministry. Here is what you discover in the calling of Paul the Apostle. Number one, he was saved. I just read it to you in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 through to verse 15. That this is a faithful saying. That Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And think about the sinners that were saved. The cheapest of them, the greatest of them, the most sinful of them, is this man you are looking at, Paul the Apostle. Number one, he was saved. Number two, he was set apart, he was separated. And the Lord separated him from any other job, any other profession, any other activity, any other responsibility. 
You know that Paul the Apostle could have been a fine, great politician. The Lord separated him from politics. And Paul the Apostle could have been a great community man. Rallying the people, talking to the people, mobilizing the people for this particular community. And the Lord separated him from being the counselor or whatever of a community. And Paul the Apostle could have been a great brain and a great educationist. And he could have been involved in so much of the education of the day. And the Lord separated him from the educational system then. And Paul the Apostle could have been a great religious leader among the Sanhedrin. And the Lord separated him from the Sanhedrin. And he said, I could have even profited more in the Jewish religion, more than many my equals. And yet the Lord separated him. Would you understand then? You are a separated man. You are a separated woman. And what the Lord has separated you to is greater than what your colleagues in the world are doing. And I pray that the great privilege that God has separated you to, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. Number three, he was a sanctified man. Saved, set apart and separated, then sanctified. And you listen to his testimony and you will say that this man, yes, he was saved. Yes, he was separated. Yes, he was sanctified. In first um, Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. He are witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. Now, as we say that was a sanctified man, do you know that everything that happened to Paul was not by his own might or his own power? And there is nothing that happened to Paul that could not happen to you. And there is nothing that Paul received that you cannot receive. He was saved, you are saved. He was set apart, you are set apart. And he was sanctified, you are sanctified. Because it's by the grace of God we get sanctified. It's by the help of God we get sanctified. And you might be thinking that that Paul was a strong man. He was a great man. He was a determined man. He was a man of conviction. And that, no wonder, no wonder he lived such a righteous and holy life. My brother, my sister, it can happen to you too because it's all by grace. If he received it by grace, that same grace that gave him everything that, is, that he had, that same grace will give you everything in Jesus' name. Because he said, holily, justly, unblameably, we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Remember, it's all of grace. Number four, he was spirit-filled. Spirit-filled. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. It says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. This man was spirit filled as well. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and to the uttermost part of the earth. The promise is unto you, and to your children, and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. It says that, when he came to preach, he did not come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Then, number five, he was sent. It is one thing to be saved. It's another thing to be separated and set apart, and then to be sanctified, and then to be spirit-filled. But you understand that... There is ministry in many places as we, even, even in our church, in deeper life, we have ministry in many places. We can be over here at the headquarters in Lagos. We can be over there in the southwest in Nigeria. We can be over there in the northeast or northwest of Nigeria. We can be in the middle belt or we can be in south-south or we can be in southeast. Or we can be in West Africa, in another country, or any other part of Africa. But he was sent. Sent to a particular place. Not only that, even in a local church as we are here. And the Lord picks us up. And then he lies the various ministries there. 
we have the, the, the youth ministry, and we have the children's ministry, and we have the uh, campus ministry, and we have the choir there, and the usher is there, the ushers are there, and the security people are there, and the women ministry is there, many, many things that we're doing. And we have some people that are on full time, and uh, they, they give all their lives, and they're doing some particular things, essential ministry in the house of God. But we cannot be here and there and there and everywhere at the same time. You become a saint man. A saint woman. Well, you understand, my brother, then, that this section of the area of the walk where you are, God sent you there. And before you cross over to another place, remember, God sent me here. You may be in the language church. God sent you there. Understand then, Paul the Apostle was a saint man. As you look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, verse 4. So the being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. They were saved, and the Lord has sent you. That place where the Lord has sent you, I pray you will concentrate there. And you see, there are some people, they are over here, and while they are singing in the choir, maybe their minds are thinking that uh, the other people are more appreciated, and the other people are doing some greater jobs. In our church over here, we uh, recently reorganized and we said that uh, it, is, it takes a long time to be able to play the instrument. And it takes a long time to be able to do this or that in the choir. Therefore, all those people that have been in this area, this area, this area, and you've been having a lot of things together, stay in the choir. We want you there. The Lord has sent you there. And then we're going to choose other people. They're going to be in other areas. You know, sometimes the devil may deceive us and begin to walk in our minds. Am I going to just stay here? This ordinary thing. It's not ordinary. When God sends us somewhere, that thing is special. Take it as special, and the Lord will use that ministry in Jesus' name. And so, we understand where God has sent us. Whether it is in this city or another city, He sent you there. Be faithful there, and the work of your hand will be rewarded. Number six, He was strong. He was strong. The Spirit of the Lord strengthened Him. And then that's the reason why uh, you need to understand the same strength he had, that same strength, it tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That same strength is available for you. The Lord will strengthen you in the inner man. And you will do your work effectively without any failure and without um, any backsliding in Jesus' name. Then I told you it was singular. He was singular. That, that means that he was a peculiar person. He was not like everybody else. And then that's what you'll find. In fact, what reference are you going to read? Everything you read about Paul the Apostle will show you that he was a peculiar, singular man, singular minister of the gospel of the Lord. He was an apostle, not like the rest of the apostles. He was a prophet, but not like the rest of the prophets. He was an evangelist and missionary, but not like the rest of the missionaries and the evangelists. He was a pastor, and he was a lover of the souls. He said the cares of the church, the cares within, the cares without. He was not like other pastors. He was a teacher of the word of God. He taught the Gentiles, he taught the Jews, he taught the word of God, and he taught in writing, he taught in speaking, he taught everywhere. He was a teacher, not like any other teacher. And the Lord is calling you because the Lord has made Paul the Apostle a pattern. And since the Lord made him a pattern, that means you have to be like that. Number one, you have to be saved and you are saved. You have to be set apart, separated and you are. You have to be sanctified. The grace of God to be sanctified is available. And you have to be spirit filled. The Lord will fill you to overflowing. And then you have to be saved. You have been saved already. That's why you are here. You have a section of the work you are involved in. You have to be strong. Be strong in the Lord. In the grace of the Lord. The same strength available to Paul the Apostle is available for you. Number seven, you have to be singular, peculiar. And don't allow anything to make you like ordinary. And the place, high place, where the Lord has placed you, nothing will bring you down. If you are going to move at all, you will move up, you will not move down. I come to point number two, and it is the commission to sanctifying service. 
the commission to sanctify service and the kind of service the Lord has given you, the Lord has given me, giving every one of us is to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. It's like you think about the ministry of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. Here we are told, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. That's what the Lord wants you to do with the Word of God. You are teaching the house fellowship, you are preaching on Sunday, or you are ministering on Thursday or Friday, or you are ministering at the, uh, the retreat, you are to turn to the Lord, the, the people of God. Turn their hearts to the Lord. In verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias and to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared unto the Lord, for the Lord. That's the ministry. That's what we're called upon to do. How do we do that? With what do we do that? In Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. You must remember how it happened when you were born again. These, uh, uh, these early, those early years, when you knew the Lord, it was in your heart to speak to everybody. On the bus, you were speaking to somebody. And on the road, you were speaking to somebody. In your community, you were speaking to everybody. You might not even know the ramifications and the depth and the height, the implication of uh, the commandment of the Lord, of the Great Commission. Preach the gospel to every creature. You did it before. Can you still do it again? You can do it again. You can do it again. If you did it before, you can do it again. You know, sometimes you've been doing something good and something marvelous, something that's the will of God. But for one reason or the other, maybe you stopped it. And then it will appear to you that you cannot pick it up again, but you can. At the, uh, the very first day or the first week, it will look like it's a little bit difficult. Don't worry about that. Just keep on doing it and you'll find that the same fire that was there before, the same zeal you had before, the same enthusiasm you had before, and the same skill, the same ability you had before to be able to do it will come back as you get started. We are to preach the gospel to every creature. And as you think about what we are to do, uh, let's put it this way. Number one, you preach the gospel. That's what we just read. Number two, you prepare God's people for Christ's coming. That's what we read in Luke chapter 1. One, preach. Two, prepare. Number three, perfect the people of God. Perfect the people of God. And you look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading there from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 11. Here is the calling of the minister. Here is the calling of the people of God, of the servants of the Lord. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. For the perfecting, the purifying, and the maturing of the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Number one, you preach. Number two, you prepare God's people for the coming of the Lord. Number three, you perfect the people of God so that we can be ready. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Perfect in Christ Jesus. You know what the Lord is telling us here? The, the Lord is saying that you are to perfect everyone that you are ministering to. You are not to do it by yourself, but the words you speak, the prayers you pray, the encouragement you give, the instruction you give, the support you give, the comfort and assurance you give, all those things should be tailored towards perfecting people. We should not uh, say anything or do anything in our ministry that will discourage people 
and make them move away from being perfect. Maybe they are nearer perfection. They are going towards perfection already by the ministry of your brother, by the ministry of your sister. That other people have been ministering to them. You understand this thing that we are talking about? It's not just your ministry alone. It's not just my ministry alone that will affect the same. But it is a combination of all our ministries together. And that brother is doing his part, that sister is doing his part, and he's moving the people of God towards the direction of perfection. Then I come in. Then you come in. Let's contribute to what the others have done. Let us add to what the others have done. And let us help other people as other people are moving them towards perfection, which you will come in our little bit. And our little contribution will move them in that same direction to Perfection. Read that verse again now, and then you understand when you are talking to other people. Uh, you don't make them to hate perfection, hate holiness. You don't make them to say, ah, why is this brother talking to me like this? Why is this uh, brother preaching like this? Why is this leader preaching like this? Okay, if it's like that, I know I cannot do it. I know I'm not qualified. I know I cannot be as holy as I ought to be. I give up. It's even too tough for me. You will speak in such a way, you will minister in such a way that you are moving people on towards the direction of perfection. Verse 28, Colossians chapter 1, whom we preach, we, all of us, we are doing it together. Warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we, we, we are doing it together. You have a part to play, I have a part to play. I cannot do it all, you cannot do it all. We combine together that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Number four, we are to preserve the truth. Preserve the truth. And that's our calling. That's the commission to sanctifying service. In Jude verse 3. Jude verse 3. It tells us, Beloved, when I give all diligence, to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, where to preserve the truth of the word of God. Uh, you see the details of your ministry and my ministry? Preach the gospel. Prepare God's people for Christ's coming. Perfect the people of God. Preserve the truth. Number, number five, prevent Corruption. Prevent corruption. You see, there's a devil in the world. And there are agents of the devil in the world. They want to pollute the gospel of the Lord. They want to corrupt the word of God. But you will stand up straight and stand up firm with the wisdom of God, with the love of God, with the grace of God to prevent, to prevent corruption. In Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse, uh, verse 4. Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. And that, and that because of false brethren, on our way has brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Uh, there were false prophets and false teachers and uh, people that wanted to corrupt the gospel. They came into the assembly. And Paul the apostle said, we have a duty. We have a responsibility. And it is to prevent corruption. And so, when those false preachers, the preachers of false, uh, of false uh, doctrine, when he came in, we didn't give them any chance, no, not one hour. Number six, we're to protect God's people from error and backsliding. That's what we're to do. That's our ministry. And that's why uh, we look at our commission. And we look at the thing that the Lord has given us to do. And whether it is morning or afternoon or night, whether it is on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday, whether it is on the Wednesday or Tuesday leaders' meeting, or whether it is Friday or Thursday revival hour, or whether it is Saturday combined workers' meeting, we're very vigilant as the ministers of the gospel, as the leaders over the people, that there will be no corruption, there will be no error, and you're helping the people of God and protecting them from backsliding. 
Because one of our responsibilities is that we we'll protect God's people from error and from backsliding. In Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three, verse seventeen. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. Beware, lest ye also be led away for the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. You see, the people of God, the ministers that went before us, they were always helping and supporting, encouraging and instructing the people of God that they will look at error from a distance and they will run away from that error. They will not follow the error of religion and the error of society and the error of the people that are perpetrating evil. And uh, they encourage people to commit sin. That the ministers of God, the preachers of the gospel and the leaders in the church will prevent and protect God's people from error and backsliding. And as we are talking, we are not just talking about the pastor of a local church. We're not just talking about the overseer of a region of, of a state. Of course, some of us who are leaders and overseers and pastors, we know that already. But even in the area, the special area the Lord has given you, in that house fellowship, you are protecting the people of God there from error and from backsliding. And then in our women's section, in our women's ministry, you will not say, I am jo- I'm, not, I'm just a woman. What do you mean, just a woman? Deborah, was, just, was that just a woman? And would you say, Mary, I'm I'm just a woman? Would you say that, Mary, I'm just a woman? Would you say that, Dorcas, I'm just a woman? No. Whoever you are, whatever the ministry the Lord has given you, it's an important ministry. And even in the women's section, you have to protect the people of God from error and from backsliding. And if in your women fellowship you see that uh, somebody is uh, trying to perpetrate error and is trying to bring false doctrine, you will not say, well, I-, I will tell our coordinator when we finish and he will be able to do it later. My dear sister, some of the people in that meeting may not be there anymore when the coordinator comes. And therefore, at that time, when you are there, you are the person in charge of that women fellowship at that time. In the children's section, we're bringing up the children, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he shall not depart from it. Those children, as they are born again, they become God's people. God's people are not just adults. There are children among God's people. And there are youths among teenagers among God's people. There are campus people among God's people. Whichever area you are walking in, you have to protect God's people from error and backsliding. Number seven, provide adequately for the spiritual need of God's people. Provide adequately. For the spiritual need of God's people. And that's exactly what we're to do. And then that's the reason why the Lord has put you there. It's like, uh, you know, the, the father and the family, the mother and the family, providing adequately for the children, for the members of the family. The Lord has put you there. Do your work, and the Lord will assist you in Jesus' name. In John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes not. But for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. That's why Jesus came. And now you are to go to the people and offer to them what Jesus has provided for them on the cross of Calvary. Through his redemptive work, he has given us life. He has given us abundant life. But many of the people of God, they do not know that. They do not know that. Abundant life spiritually, abundant life naturally, abundant life in every way has been provided for us. And the Lord has sent you to the people of God so that you will tell the people of God, abundance is available for you. Number one, we're to preach the gospel. Number two, we're to prepare God's people for the coming of Christ. Number three, we're to perfect the people of God. Number four, we're to preserve the truth. Number five, we're to prevent corruption. Number six, we're to protect God's people from error and backsliding. Number seven, we're to provide adequately for the spiritual need of God's people. Point number three. Our commitment to sacrificial service. Our commitment to sacrificial service. As we look at our calling, 
and you look at what the Lord has given us to do, you will see that He has called us to sacrificial service. Uh, we thank God as you think about uh, the sacrificial service of today. And you compare with the sacrificial service of uh, the days gone by. You'll almost think that even the sacrifice we say we are called to, if you think about it, the Lord has even made things easy for us. You think about Moses before, Pharaoh and the magicians. Uh, your own is not as difficult as that. And you think about David before Goliath facing death right there. And David was still standing at his post. And David was still saying, I'm going to do the will of God. And I'm going to destroy this enemy of the people of God. Your own assignment is not as difficult as that. And you find Daniel in Babylon. And he challenges that Daniel faced. And he proposed in his heart. As you think about your ministry today, what challenge have you got that is as great as that of Daniel? And then you think about Paul the Apostle as he was preaching that the heathen people, the pagan people, they took up stones and they began to stone him until they thought he died. And he got up again and was preaching the gospel. Your challenge is not as difficult as that. And you think of Stephen, that when he exalted the Lord Jesus Christ above the old covenant and the temple worship, what they did was to stone him until he died. And he was faithful. Your own challenge is not as difficult as that. If then our challenge is not as difficult as the challenge of the people that went before us, why will you back out? Why will you say this is too tough? What is tough? What have you seen? What have you known? What have you experienced? And what opposition and what persecution have you got that you are talking about? And the Lord has just allowed some little, little problems, some little difficulties and some little opposition so that He'll be able to give us reward on the final day. If you think about when the Bible uh, had been written, and the Bible was to be translated to the language of many people, the persecution that those translators received, and the way the people dealt with the Bible, but the Lord has preserved the word of God. Now we have the Bible in our hand. Now there is freedom to be able to preach and to go about and there is no challenge at all that we are facing today that is comparable to the challenges they faced at that time. If those people that faced a greater challenge, if they were able to receive the grace to be faithful and to remain steadfast with you by the grace of God, in the little, little problems that we have, we are going to be faithful in Jesus' name. But you see, if you are going to be faithful, if I am going to be faithful, I need to keep on thinking of the calling the Lord has given me. You need to be thinking of the calling the Lord has given you, and that you will continue until you fulfill the ministry. In Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, I'm reading to you from verse 24, Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I in my life down to myself, so that I might finish the cause, my cause for joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. He said, none of those things move me. And that's what you ought to be saying to yourself. None of those things move you. The said there's difficulty. None of those things move you. Ah, you are preaching to that a woman. If the husband knows about that, you are going to get into trouble because that man is hard. None of these things move me. You are encouraging that a little teenage girl and teenage boy to come to the church and to give a life to the Lord. If the parents know, those parents are not going to take it easy with you. None of these things move me. You are distributing trash to your place of work. If the boss will see you, you will get into trouble. You might lose your job. None of these things move me. You are getting yourself committed. And your parents, if your parents know about this, they might even say that they are not going to pay school fees anymore. None of these things move me. How you see you are standing up in the bus when you are preaching? If your husband hears anything like that, he will remind you of, uh, you know, the kind of family you belong to. Don't degrade us and disgrace us as you are standing up in the bus and preaching. None of these things move me. 
Are you mad? You, you want to serve the Lord now. You want to do this, you want to do that. If your wife will react to that thing, you'll be surprised. This thing can be fire in the home. None of these things move me. What the Lord is telling us is, if we're going to be committed, we will not allow any challenge. We will not allow anything that people may do, that people may say to move us, or to hinder us from doing the will of God. We will do the will of God. We'll do the work of God. We'll preach the word of God. And whatever happens, none of those things will move us in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21. Acts 21, verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came, there, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and he bowed his own hands. And his feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we had these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What me to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded with these, saying, The will of the Lord be done. Here Paul the Apostle knew what he had gotten into. And he knew what he was going to do. And therefore when the people were saying, Paul the Apostle, you are going to get into trouble. This is going to happen and this is going to happen. Then he said, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself at all. What me to weep and to break my heart and to try to bend me and to try to make me change so that I will not suffer. I am ready not only to be bound but to die at Jerusalem. Think about that. Our own is not as serious as that. Nobody is killing you today. Nobody is, uh, you know, cutting off your head or uh, nobody is passing you through the guillotine because you are preaching the gospel. The little, little, little problems that may arise, the grace of God will see you through. You will keep on taking your stand. And this calling the Lord has given you, you will fulfill it in Jesus' name. As you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah, uh, see here, this, uh, this man of God, he too had difficulty, but even in all the difficulties, see him as he was still saying, I am going to stand, and stand till the very end. You see, when you think about the difficulties you have, it will be similar to this of uh, Nehemiah. And sometimes they will reproach you. Sometimes they will insult you. Sometimes they will belittle you. Sometimes they will look down on you. So, sometimes they will even depreciate the value of the work you are doing. Maybe you have just done something and you are happy because you know that the Lord has really used you in that house fellowship. The Lord has really used you in that area of ministry. And then while you are rejoicing, somebody is likely to come to say, what are you doing after all? What's the value of what you are doing? Do you think that thing is significant at all in the house of God? Don't mind. Don't listen to them. And that's your own part of the cross to bear. It says in Nehemiah chapter 4, reading from verse 1, But it came to pass that when Shambhalat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, and he took great indignation, and he mocked the Jews, and he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these people what do these people Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burnt now to buy the Ammonite was by him? And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear our God. For we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Look at verse 6. So we, so built we the wall. So built we the wall. We kept on walking. They despised us. We kept on building. 
and he reproached us, we kept on building. That means, man, whatever you are going through, and whatever it may be, do not leave your post of duty just because there are some people that do not appreciate. If they do not appreciate, thank God, Almighty God appreciates your work. And He is the one that is going to reward you on that final day. Look at chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 1. Now, it came to pass, where Shambhalat and Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies, heard that I had built the wall, that there was no bridge left therein. Though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Shambhalat and Geshem said to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. They changed their method. When they saw that uh, the reproach and the insult and whatever it is did not work on the human, then they changed. They said, let's go together into a particular village, into a secret place, so that we'll be able to discuss and have some plans there. I sent messengers saying, I am doing a great work. You are doing a great work. I said you are doing a great work. How oh, I thank God that you are here at this workers' retreat, brothers and sisters. You do not know how much we appreciate your coming. Because we, we, we ask the, the time, we fix the time. Then we change the time. And then we change the time again because we are waiting for the equipment that uh, will broadcast everything to the various locations. You know, in my mind I thought, because we have changed the time uh, about two times, I felt we'll not have all the people we ought to have. They're taking permission at the first time, and they may not give them permission anymore. And I came here last night, and I saw the, your faithfulness and your commitment and the way you are still able to make it, and I'm really encouraged. I pray God will bless you. And the seal God has given you, the faithfulness God has given you, that faithfulness will never leave you in Jesus' name. And so the man said, I'm doing a great work. So I cannot come down. You will not go down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Well, the Lord is telling us that we need commitment for sacrificial service. And what does that mean? What does that translate to in your life and in my life? Number one, consecration and faithfulness. Now, just, just have that in your heart. I'm consecrated to the Lord today, and I live a day at a time. What God helped me to do today, I'll repeat it tomorrow. I'll repeat it tomorrow, until it becomes habitual for me. Until my heart, my mind, my spirit will normally go in the direction of consecration and faithfulness. Number two, concentration and focus. Don't be distracted. What the ministry the Lord has given you, keep on improving it. Keep on getting better in that area. Keep on being more effective in that area. Concentration and focus. And then number three, conviction and firmness. Conviction. The conviction that Daniel had. Conviction. And the conviction that Peter and John had. Whether it be right to obey you rather than God, you judge thee. But we must be obedient to what we have heard from the Lord. And the conviction that Paul the Apostle had when he said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, conviction and firmness. Number four, cross-bearing and forbearance. There will be some cross to bear. And thank God it's not too heavy. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord has called you. And even though there may be some cross you will have to bear, cross-bearing and for and forbearance, number five, courage and fortitude. You need to be courageous, courageous in your mind. And uh, the Lord strengthens you a step at a time as you are going on on the way. And then number six, continuation until we finish. Continuation until we finish. Continuation until we finish. Don't be tired. Continue. Your work will be blessed of the Lord. Let us rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and honor the Lord. He has called us. He has commissioned us. Now, we need to face that call and commission with real commitment.